all dependent on mining. We don't often think of it, but the jewelry that we wear, the cell phones that we carry, the very buildings that we inhabit are all because mined materials are used to make them. Even the electricity powering these lights in Moscow, Idaho, comes from, in part, a coal mine out in eastern Montana. When we think about mining in North Idaho, quite commonly we think of the underground mines in the Silver Valley, where you pursue very intently a narrow strip of ore in order to get the silver or gold out. But more commonly, we have open pit mines. This is the Morency Copper Mine in Arizona. It's about 10 miles, the disturbed zone that you see in this image from the top to the bottom, and it's a mile and a half wide. Now this is a modern copper mine, and so they're using modern mining techniques in that they drill or they dig several pits, and after the, they're done with the first pit, they start on the second, and they use the waste rock from the second pit to fill the first pit. And this helps minimize the environmental disturbance. But this has not always been the case. This is a NASA image of the Butte pit, or the Berkeley pit in Butte, Montana. What we see here is also a copper mine. It was abandoned in 1982 after operating for about 30 years. You can see there is a very large pit lake and then off to the left-hand side of the side slide, you can see the tailings pond from this. Butte, Montana, in this site, is the largest Superfund site in the US. A large part of that is because the pit lake is filled with water that is not only highly acidic, but laden with heavy minerals from the mine. In fact, the pH in this pit lake is 2.5. That's about the same acidity as lemon juice. And you might remember about two years ago, some geese were forced onto the lake by a sudden snowstorm. They all died when they ran in contact with the water. 3,000 geese immediately died because of this environmental disruption. Of course, Butte is kind of an extreme example. A more common abandoned mine is seen here. This is the Anaconda Pit in Yarrington, Nevada. Again, this is an abandoned copper mine. It also has a pit lake that is filled with water, and it's also a Superfund site. It was recently put on the national priority list for Superfund. In, in this case, it's not the water in the pit lake that's the problem. It's the abandoned tailings ponds. Now, tailings are what's left after you extract the ore from the mine. And in order to get that ore out, or get the metal out, they treat the ore with chemicals, and then some ore materials are left behind. In Yarrington, this is a Superfund site because those tailing ponds have dried up, and now the dust from that site is blowing across the town. And this is called the fugitive dust problem. It's a major problem in many abandoned mine sites. So my point of this talk is not to convince you that abandoned mine sites are bad. This is just the way it is, and we need to deal with it. My mother always used to tell me when I was young, don't just whine about a problem. What are you going to do to solve it? And so before I talk about solving that problem, I'm going to introduce you to a different problem that is also critical. And that is the need for energy storage, for renewable energy sources. We don't often think about the electricity that we use because we flip a switch and the lights turn on. But we don't really think that that electricity that's powering that light was only generated moments before you need it because the US electric grid has virtually no energy storage capacity in it. Now, that's a problem when you want to move to intermittent renewable energy sources, because we all know the sun doesn't shine all the time. The wind doesn't blow all the time. And you can't predict, with the wind particularly, when is it going to blow? And how are we going to harness that power of the wind to create a reliable energy source? Well, the way you do it is through energy storage. 
In fact, in 2015, right after the Paris Accords were signed, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Ma, and about 20 other uber wealthy people created what they call the Breakthrough Energy Coalition in order to help fund startups with ideas to do things to make renewable energy a true reality. Now, Bill Gates and the Breakthrough Energy Coalition have identified the need for grid scale energy storage as one of the prime concerns because you cannot have a reliable grid without energy storage if you're going to rely on these intermittent energy sources. So they announced the formation of this coalition and like the astute people they were, they immediately put up a social media site and it was almost instantly inundated with hundreds of comments of people saying things like, I have the solution to your problem. If you would only suspend one of the laws of physics, I can solve all your problems right away. Now, you know, I know Bill Gates is rich and I know he's powerful, but he does not have the ability to change the laws that operate in our universe. So, I'm gonna propose a solution to these two problems I identified. And I have a PhD in geophysics, and I promise you, I will not violate any of the laws of physics. So what we have here is a schematic cross-sectional view of, let's say, the Yarrington pit that we saw earlier. What you have here is the empty pit because we've removed all the water. The first thing we'd like to do after the water is gone is line the bottom of the pit with an impermeable layer. Now this could be something as ubiquitous as clay. It could be the very fine residuals in the tailings ponds. It could be old car tires. It could be cement made from fly ash from a coal burning power plant. It just needs to be impermeable. Next, what we'd like to do is start putting the waste piles that are immediately outside the pit back into the hole, thus permanently starting to clean up this environment. Then we'll cap that again with another layer of impermeable material. What we've created now is a pressure vessel that's residing at the bottom of the mine. And then we'll continue to load the rest of the waste material that are again in piles surrounding these large pits until the pit is filled. So now we have cleaned up the entire site. We have an encapsulated pore space at the bottom of the mine. And what we'll do is when the wind blows, we'll start providing energy to air compressors and we will pump air into the bottom of this pit. And it will stay because it's surrounded by impermeable material. Then when energy is needed, we can release this compressed air through a series of turbines, regenerate electricity, and feed it onto the electrical grid when it's needed. Now this concept of storing energy as compressed air is not new. In fact, it's been in operation since 1978 in Germany. But it's been limited to salt domes, which can be hollowed out in the production of salt, and salt forms a wonderful seal for compressed air. The problem is salt domes are very geographically limited in the world. Abandoned mine sites are not. And so we can continue doing this cycle over and over again. And because there are no moving parts in the pressure vessel, this system can last for years. We're estimating our economics on about a 50-year lifespan, but in fact, we suspect it could last for 100 years or more. And then when you amortize the cost of building this over the time frame of the life of the renewable energy power plant, it is without a doubt economic. And so, but further than that, it is just, economically so sensible to turn a liability of these abandoned toxic sites into an asset of a renewable energy power plant. And so, once again, let's look at the Yarrington pit. 
we have here something on the national priority list of Superfund. The governor of Nevada only allowed that designation with the, the admonition of the EPA that they create a public-private partnership to clean up this site and to try to generate some economic activity in this town. Because when these large pit mines are closed, quite often the town that surrounds it is decimated. This was the source of most of the jobs in the town. You close the mine, you might as well close the town. So what we're proposing is instead of having this be what Yarrington looks like, let's have it look like this. The pit is gone, the site is cleaned up, and you have the renewable energy power plant that can provide enough renewable energy so that Reno Sparks can be 100% renewable energy. I think we can do better than what we're doing now. And this solution, I think, not only doesn't violate a single law of physics, but provides two solutions to two critical problems. Thank you.